those of you that are tuning in, the message this morning is for the young people. And uh, I felt it important to do a message for young people, for teenagers. Um, and we're going to take our time. Uh, I think it's important. I know if, if you've been able to bring a teenager to, to watch this, if you watch it on YouTube, if you're on live stream, uh, I know that the time is probably limited um, because I guarantee you they're going to want to get right back to um, that video game they were on earlier. So uh, we're going to speak about several scriptures that are applied to, to, to young people and, and specifically young people. And then I would like to just talk to you myself. And I may elaborate on the scriptures as well as we go. We'll start off by going to Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. I just want to look at a couple of the commandments here. And, uh, and, and, and just really kind of encourage you. And let me just say for the young people as well that, you know, understand the most important thing you can do in life is what you do for Christ, what you do for Yeshua. That's what's important. What we do ourselves is nothing, but what we do for Him is everything. And if you don't know Yeshua as your own Savior as of yet, let me encourage you that today is not too late. Today is as good as day as any. And I think it'd be really... And, and when I say that, I don't want to um, talk you into something. I want it to be that... the. Holy Spirit, that God Himself convicts your own heart that you would give your life to Christ. Because um, when I say Christ, I'm talking about Yeshua, Mashiach. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, let's, like I said, let's turn to Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, I believe is where I'm going to go to. Um, let's just see. No, it's not actually verse 12 there. I don't know. Maybe I wrote it down wrong here. Um, oh, I'm in the wrong. No, I think I did right. I wrote it down right. I'm, I'm in the wrong chapter. All right. Praise be to God. Um, before we go to verse 12, well, no, let's go ahead and read verse 12 first. And this is one I'm sure uh, if you're living at home and you have Christian parents, you've definitely heard this one many times. Honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, if you had a dad like mine, uh, he would tell you right quick, like, he would quote that scripture to you, and he says, if you want to live a little longer, you better show some respect to your father. So, <laughs> you know, so he planned on being the executioner of God's commandment. But, um, but in all sincerity, though, it's so important that we honor our parents uh, do you know in the, in the, in the, uh, you know, I hear people say a lot of times in biblical times, we're still in biblical times. We haven't left biblical times. So these laws are not for some time in the past where it doesn't matter any longer. It's you're still in biblical times. As long as there's a human race on the earth and redemption is not complete, we are in biblical times. So, therefore, his word is just as important today as it was back then, you know. Now, in the, as what we would call biblical times, in the times when Moses was here and, and, and Aaron and the law was given to the children of Israel, and he said, honor thy father and thy mother, not just that you would live long in the earth, the commandment of God was if you dishonored your mother and father, you would die. You were to be taken out and stoned to death. In fact, when Jesus came, when he came, and I'm going to probably use that name more people that are listening, uh, for the sake of the young people, not many young people know Yeshua, but I'll let you know too, Yeshua is his real name. But uh, when you think about this, Jesus, he comes along, and in the parable, he brings up this. He said, it's been said, it's, the word of God says, honor your father and mother, and those that did not were to die the death. But he said, you change that. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing it. You changed it. You know, you said, if it's for Corbin, then it's all right. You know, he can be free. But Jesus said, that's not what the word says. You know, he's basically letting you know, that's not what God's intention was. 
Now let me just show you. Nowadays, you're not stoned because you don't obey your father and mother. That's true. But I can tell you one thing. There's a couple of, there's a couple of repercussions that go with that. If you dishonor your mother and your father, and all you do and you're, and you're rebellious, you'll end up in jail. That's what happens to people that are like that. And then even still yet, worse than that, you still got to stand before God eventually. And when you stand before God, God is not going to be playing church. He's going to ask you when he looks back at your life and ask you, why didn't you honor your father and your mother? You know, now there's mercy. That's what's so wonderful about Yeshua. No matter how stooped in sin we ever become. And even young people get into the same types of things. In fact, today it's worse than it was when I was young. I mean, I think probably the worst thing we got into when I was young is you might have smoked a cigarette or you, or you got caught drinking a beer or something like that. Nowadays, it's everything. Promiscuity was not a big issue when I was young. I mean, you know, that was some, one of the things that maybe a few people in school did or something like that. And nowadays it's every day, everywhere. And it's not, and it's at younger ages. You know, normally it was 16, 17, 18 when I was young. And, and only a few people in school actually were promiscuous. It was, it was, it would have become it's become more wicked as time has come along. So I know for the teenagers that are, that are listening, you guys, I know it's harder. The pressures of the world are much greater than when it was when I was young or your grandparents were young, you know, or, or, or so on and so forth. Even your great-grandparents, you know, the time has changed so rapidly and so wickedly. It's like we are living in Sodom and Gomorrah today. And so it's gotten much, much, much worse. So anyway, <clears throat> I wanted to read that to you there to honor your father and mother. Now we're going to come back in just a little bit to the first commandment of God. Um, and um, actually, um, now I don't have it right before me now, but the commandment that I want to bring to your attention in a moment is going to be Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And you know what? Maybe I should just go ahead and speak about that now. Sometimes we, we wonder, what does, what does it mean to have gods before me? Have no other gods before me. That, some people might think, well, you know, I only worship Jesus. I, I don't have any other gods. But you'd be surprised how many other gods people have. And especially in the hour we're living in, people think a lot of times, you know, if, if the Lord says, have no other gods before me, then in other words, don't, don't have the Muslim God, uh, Allah. Don't have uh, the Hindu God or don't have uh, uh, the Buddhist God or whatever, whatever gods that they all have, don't have that or don't have statues and idols. That's normally what comes to mind when we think of the commandment of God, have no other gods before me. But you have to understand, anything that you exalt above Him, above Yeshua, anything that we exalt above Him is a God. Now that's the hard part. What, what are some of the things that we might exalt above Him? Now today, I can tell you hands down, it's video games for most people. Most young people, it's video games. And believe me, I, I am a witness and I can tell you right now what will happen to people with video games. It totally takes control of the human mind. I don't care how innocent the game is. I have seen children, I've seen teenagers, uh, I saw one young man in my life that he would watch and he, and he started off with simple little games and as time prevailed on in his life, they got harder and harder and more violent and more violent. And when he became about 17 years old, the Iraqi war was, was just gearing up. And because of these video games, he had to go to war to kill as many Iraqis as he possibly could. But when he went in the military... The reality of what war really was when the video games were not so prominent anymore in his mind and he was able to get 
away from that because you have to remember what causes someone to want to put a video game above God. Now, you might say, oh, brother Steve, I, I don't put the video games above God. I like to play video games, but I don't put them above God. If you spend more time playing the video game than you do uh, in the study of God's Word or meditating about God upon your mind, I have to put those as a combination because I realize, you know, you may have to drive your car more often than you get to read your Bible. But what are you doing when you're driving your car? Are you playing Christian music? Are you, are you meditating upon the Lord? Are you praying in your heart? You know, what did God say? What did David say? He said, Lord, uh, let me put them on the doorpost of my house. Let me put them on, on, on the, uh, over the, the bedpost of my bed. You know, let your word, let me meditate upon your word day and night. So when he says, have no other gods before me, anything that you're meditating on day and night, and believe me, this is just as good for adults. I know adults that are still caught up, not just in video games and movies and everything else. And I'm not condemning the fact that you might not enjoy watching a movie. I'd be very careful about what kind of movie I watch as well. You know, the language and the promiscuity in the movies, I mean, it's very hard to see anything that's clean, you know? So you have to be careful even with that, what you're watching. But, the, but when it comes to like the video games, they consume the human mind. And that becomes your God. I know you don't like to hear that, but it becomes your God. If your meditation day and night is upon the game and when you're done with the game, you're acting out what you see in the game, it's your God. As hard as that may be to hear, it has become your God. And I know we don't want to hear these things, but we want our mind and our thoughts upon Yeshua day and night, day in and day. You know, I know some people say, how can you do that? Oh, believe me, fall in love with Yeshua. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Get salvation. Find, let him, you know, let, you know, he said, no man can come to me except God draws him first. You start feeling the Lord tugging at your heart, something in you. You might be listening to this message here and something begins to tug on your heart. I must know him. I got to know Christ. I need to know him. That's what I'm talking about. You need, if you get a relationship with him, you will have that desire to want to serve him. Now there is a process. I mean, you accept him as your savior and the cares of the world will still be right there at your doorstep. Satan will be knocking at your door. But once you've given your life to Jesus Christ, the most important thing you can do then is to press forward, you know, say, God, clean my life up. Take all the unbelief out of me. Take all the ungodliness out of me. You know, I, can, I won't say that when you give your life to Christ that you won't still have a desire to play a video game, but you know what? You can ask God to deliver you from it. And I can remember one time I was given a, a video game, a helicopter game to play to fly helicopters. I always wanted to fly helicopters. My father flew helicopters. And, and so I always had that desire to want to do it. So I was given a game one time to do that. And, and I got really caught up into that game. And I finally had to just throw it away. Because I saw immediately as a Christian, this is taking me away from God. And I, had, I wanted no part of that. So I just really strongly encourage you. You have to be careful because Satan, you have to, you know, let, me, let me just say like this here. God wrote a Bible, okay? You all guys can see this. I know both cameras can see this. God, God wrote his word. He pinned it down. Well, for, for those of you that want to know that God wrote it in Hebrew, okay, he pinned it down. As for that camera and for this camera, whoop, wrong side. He wrote it down in the Hebrew language. He had Moses and the prophets write his word down. Okay, and this is God's billboard to you. This is God's way of getting your attention. This is what he uses to attract his people is his word. And then he's anointed people over time to sing beautiful songs about him and to worship him. And, but yet Satan has been very busy as well. Satan is doing the same thing. See, he wants control of your mind. 
And so he puts all kinds of things before you, whether it's television, uh, and, and believe me, you don't believe that, watch, watch a TV that has commercials on it, and watch how they target young people in their commercials, and older people. It depends on what your desires are. They like to target little children because of toys. To get the children to beg the parents for the toys. They like to target teenagers as well in their advertisements. They, they, especially the, the, the video games and stuff to show you the latest that's out there, the latest and the greatest video game or the movies that are playing at the theater that are enticing and, uh, and get you to go watch something that's so corrupt and so polluted. I just encourage you to put God first in everything you do. Because the video game will become your God. And I know that's hard to hear for, for young people, but let me go back to the story of this young man that I knew that did this. He went into the military and reality set in. War was dying. And then it was no longer a video game. I've got a stepbrother named Owen. And Owen, as a young man, was He's a, he's a good boy, but he still had that little rebellious streak as well, too. And he went over and he fought in Iraq as well. And he wasn't a believer at that time. But that war did something to him. He came back and when he was going over his second time, he had changed completely. He was a sergeant by that time, and when he was going over his second time, there was a bunch of young uh, privates on the, the plane, the transport plane. They were going to be going into battle. Now, the heaviest part of the battle was already over, but these young men kept talking about, I can't wait to get over there to kill me some Iraqis. And he finally had enough of it, and he stood up, and he screamed at all of them and told them to shut up. He said, you have no idea what it's like to take a life. None. And he said, you'll never be able to forget it as long as you live. The most beautiful thing, though, that happened to Owen when he came back from the war was a little later in life, he gave his life to Christ. He's on my Facebook page. And it brings tears to my eyes to see how much he loves the Lord now. I'm so proud of him. Because see, the greatest thing you can ever do in life, the greatest accomplishment you can ever have in life is to know Jesus Christ as your own Savior. Nothing you do in this life will mean nothing or amount to anything if you don't know Him. And that's, I can't encourage you enough for that. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. And um, chapter 1, and we're going to go to verse 8. This music I have playing in the background is from, uh, I think I picked up a Target called Wow or something like that. Some of the greatest music of modern times, I guess you'd call it. And... Oh, How He Loves Us is probably my favorite one on there, and that's the one that's softly playing in the background. It's just a beautiful song. and I think it's good for younger people. Believe me, they've actually got some nice music out there. I'm not into the rap or things like that, uh, but that one there is something I really enjoy. It says here, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. So don't forget, your mother has a law that you're to obey and is commanded not to forsake it. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Now when it says chains, it's talking about a golden necklace or something like that. Because believe me, God does do that in the kingdom there. We're going to find that He will adorn His sons with such things there. So... I just thought that was beautiful. And while we're in Proverbs, let's also take a look at Proverbs 23. Um, you know, the guy's singing in the background right now, oh, how he loves us. Do you realize 
He loves you so much, it's, it's not even funny. You know, I know sometimes people think they say, well, you don't know what I've done, you don't know what I've been through in life. Um, but you know, He knows. He knows exactly what you've been through in life and His love for you is undying, it's unfailing. You know, there's some people that say, well, Steve, I've, I've sinned so greatly, you have no idea what I've done in my life. There's, you know, God is done with me. I've blasphemed God and He'll have nothing else to do with me. Let me tell you how you know that, he's, that you've not crossed a line with God. If there's something inside of your heart that wants to get right with God, I don't care if you're a teenager or an adult listening to this, if there's still something in your heart that says, I would love if I could just have the moment with Him to serve Him, and if He would just let me do it, I would do it, then God is still dealing with you. See, He's not done with you. He still has, if you have that desire. I remember I had a friend of mine, he worked for the CIA, and, and uh, we were talking one day, and he was much older than I was. He was a friend of my father's, and I was out at his place, and I asked him, Mike, have you ever thought about receiving Jesus Christ? Have you, ever, have you ever pondered any of this? And he said, son, he said, for me, it's over. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, what do you mean it's over, you know? And so I asked him, I said, what do you mean, Mike? I don't understand. And he got real somber for a moment. He said, I took so many lives. I've killed so many people, Stephen. I don't think God could ever save me now. But you know what was beautiful though? That he didn't know at that moment? He was still a candidate to be saved. It showed that God was still dealing with his heart. It doesn't matter what you've done. There's still a place in your heart. That's what he created you for. He created you to fill the void in that in your heart. What we stick in our see, we stick all kinds of garbage in our heart. We might stick lust in our heart. We might stick video games in our heart. We might, you know, no, no matter what it might be, television, movies, pleasures of the world. That's not to say that you can't go have fun and do something. It's not to say that you can't go out to the beach or go skiing or or something like that or, or go horseback riding or or. Or, or hiking in the mountains or whatever the case may be you know there's not saying that you can't go have fun in life he wants you to enjoy the earth that he gave you that doesn't mean now to go out there and smoke marijuana because I can imagine that's the first thing that comes in some people's minds and everything enjoy the earth he gave me well praise God he give us marijuana no that's not what he's talking about but he wants you to enjoy life. God is not an old fuddy-duddy, just do nothing. Everything's got to be laws and strict and stuff like that. But I guarantee you one thing, you fall in love with Jesus Christ and everything in your life will change. Everything. You know, we've got a five-year-old little girl, soon to be six years old, that is so in love with Jesus Christ. I have never seen a child this in love with somebody. She walks in a room and if the movie of Jesus is playing and they don't show Jesus yet, she'll walk in there, she'll sit down and believe me, she will watch those movies when nobody else will by herself, three hour movie, and then when it ends, turn around and play it again and watch it just to be able to see Jesus. Just to get to see Him. Incredible. That's what you need. And the way you get that life with Him, when He begins to pull in your heart, then get into His Word. Get into prayer. Forget the video games. Get into prayer. Get into reading His Word. Make His Word your passion. And he, what he, you know what He'll do? He's going to wait to see what you do. And when you draw to Him, when you begin to draw to Him, He'll draw to you. He's obligated to keep His promises. Okay. So we're going to uh, Proverbs 23, verse 19. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among the wine-bibbers, among the riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, 
and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. See? He's instructing you. That, and that's a big thing, especially among teenagers that can drive. Let's go get drunk. Let's go party. You know? And, and some people might say, yeah, I know how it was. Believe me. We said the same thing when I was a young guy, too. You know, you know, you just don't know what it's like being a kid. You know, I'll tell you a little story that happened. I was probably about seven, eight years old. And my mother kept telling me, you know, when I was young, I was this and I was that. You know, and one day I said, I'm like, you were never young. I said, I'm born a kid and I'm going to stay a kid. I got stuck like this and I'll never get bigger. I don't know what's wrong. And that was hysterical to my mother. But I honestly believe that she was born an adult. She was given this privilege to rule over me as a child and I would never grow up. See, I, it's kind of some foolish stuff we go through in life, you know, no doubt. But see, he says, you know, to, to you know, Stay away from this drinking and stuff. And I never got into drinking. I had friends that did that, and, and I tried it a little bit. I didn't like the taste of it personally. It was just not something that Satan could do much with me anyway. But I know that there's people that go through that. I know there's people that, that suffer with that. But let me just say one thing to you. I hear so many people. It's hot in my office here. I don't know why, but it's hot here today. Maybe it's the lights. Um, but let me just tell you something. So many people talk about spiritual battles. They'll say, you know, you, I'm going through a really bad battle. I'm going through a bad battle. You know, Satan doesn't know anything bothers you until your big mouth opens. So once you are a Christian, once you've given your life to the Lord, or if you've already given your life to the Lord, and people talk about going, I'm going through spiritual warfare. I'm going through spiritual warfare. Sometimes we create a war that is not needed. Just like in the, the modern governments today, they go, they go through wars. They don't even need to go through wars. They just go through wars because they got to have something to do. Got to fight. You know, in the military, they teach you to keep your mouth shut. Don't move. Don't breathe. Don't touch yourself. Don't do anything. I know in basic training in the Marine Corps, it's exactly the way it was. If you, if you touched yourself, the DI would scream at you. Don't touch yourself. And why is this? Why is he teaching you like this? Because in a battlefield, if you move, if you scratch yourself or anything, you give away your position to Satan or the enemy in this case here, and he could kill you or kill the whole company. So if you go into a little temptation, don't move. Don't let Satan know that it bothers you. The Bible says if you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. And so young people, when you first give your life to the Lord and there's that temptation to go back to this or to that, you have to remember now that Satan knows that it worked on you when you were younger, but don't move. Just be still. Don't let him know that it bothers you. Now, if it's something you just can't seem to overcome, then find a brother or a sister. If it's a sister, find a sister. It's better to confide to a sister to pray for you. Now, don't find one, though, that has the same problem that you're going through. I'm sweating in here, so it makes me want to scratch. Ooh, wow, a lot of water on my head. You know, find a sister that you, can, that, that you have confidence in that's a good, grounded person. Never find someone that's going through the same battle as you, especially men or young teenagers. Don't go to another teenager and say, you know, I've been battling, I've been battling lust and stuff like that and everything. And the other guy goes, oh, it's okay. I have the same problem. That's just one devil and another devil fighting inside of you, sitting there looking for some, some help and companion. You'll find someone that's grounded in the word. And then if you're going through a problem, you know, you go and you confide. If it's a young man and you say, you know, I've got this desire to want to, to look at porn and stuff, you know, because that's really available on the Internet. You know, go to someone that you know doesn't have that problem. The mere confession of that to a friend when you can't seem to overcome it just breaks the bond of Satan. Because it's hard to do. It's hard to say something like this to someone because you, 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 you may feel embarrassed. I don't want to tell nobody. You know, that's what Satan wants. He wants you to keep you quiet completely. But remember, thoughts that pass through our mind, it's like birds flying over your head. Birds are going to fly over your head all day long. It doesn't mean that you have to let them build the net in your hair and take up keeping on your head. Satan will fly through your mind all day long if he can. 
He's going to have all kinds of thoughts. Don't entertain the thought. You don't have to turn his thought into a warfare. It doesn't have to be a spiritual battle of a warfare. Ignore his thought. He'll flee. Okay, just ignore him. I know that sounds simple, but it's true. And when you get a revelation that ignoring the devil and he flees works, believe me, your life will change. It took me a long time to get to that point, but one day I finally did, and by the grace of God, I'm like, now people talk about spiritual warfare and stuff, and I'm like, God bless you, I feel for you. My battle has already passed because I realized by His grace that He did the battle already. Christ overcame so that I can be an overcomer when I'm what? In Him. Mm, praise be to God. Uh, while we're in this area here, let's run over to Ecclesiastes real quick. Uh, no, Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. And, um, and I know some of these scriptures I'm giving you are a little... One on one thought, another's on another thought. But there's so many scriptures about young people. Chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths... The reason I wanted you to know about this one right here is because education, especially if you're in the secular system and not being educated in homeschool by your parents or in a Christian school setting, education tends to contradict the Word of God. And here's what's funny about that. Like, for example, there was a scientist uh, said at one point that there was no such thing when the Bible said that there were springs in the bottom of the sea, you know, when God said He opened up the springs in the ocean that flooded the world during Noah's time, scientists had done all kinds of explorations and they said, this is ludicrous that the Bible would even suggest such. It's totally false. It's, it's, it's not even right. Well, you know, they found out later by Jacques Cousteau's son, any of the old timers that remember Jacques Cousteau, he's a French uh, oceanographer. And they had a big television show for a long time. I used to watch it all the time when I was younger. And his sons were uh, studying sharks. And they found in this one place these sharks did not move. And they were actually able to sleep. And it was always believed that sharks never slept. They were always on the move. Because they had to in order to get the, the water to go through their, through their uh, gills in order to uh, get oxygen to keep alive. And then they discovered why. They were in like a cave there in the ocean floor and there was water coming up through a vent in the floor, a spring in the bottom of the ocean. And they were actually hovering over that spring and it kept the water flowing through their gills and they were able to rest. See, everything in the Word of God is correct. And then you have the, you know, you have the creationist, that, uh, or the, excuse me, the creationist versus evolution that says that, um, you know, Oh, the earth is millions and millions of years old and all these other guys are idiots for saying it's only six days old or something like that. Now, I'm not going to argue the fact that God did things in six days. Now, is that six literal days in our earthly time? Is it six days in His times, which would be 6,000 years? But then it still doesn't kind of address the issue about, um, you know, how the earth is. When well, Genesis 1 1, it says, Bereshit bara Elohim et ha shemaim ve et ha aretz. And then the sentence comes to an end. In the beginning, God created heavens and the earth. Now, then he goes into what he did. Now, does that mean that the earth is only 6,000 years old or could it be older? I can't really say, but I find it interesting that he talks about the heavens and the earth being created like that. But you know what? How do we know that science is right with all their fossil finding and stuff like that in the first place? I know when I was in college, we talked about Dr. Leakey, and Dr. Leakey was the uh, anthropologist that proved that, that, that the skull that they found in Africa was uh, like between human and monkey, but he was a man, and uh, it was like so many millions of years old. And another scientist comes along and does the carbon dating and says, no, it's only uh, 
half a million years old. You know, I'm thinking to myself, carbon dating, you guys get that big of a gap in there, a million years between each other, and then find out later, oh, it was a fuse between a human skull and a monkey skull, and it's all fabricated. So yes, lean not to thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and God will bless you. All right, let's take one from the, uh, the Christian Bible before we close here, because I don't want to keep you guys too long. I know for young people it's hard to sit here and go through all this. Let's go to 1 Timothy. Um, all right. Like an old guy, it's hard for me to find everything. 1 Timothy, and we're going to go to uh, chapter 4. Verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example for the believers in, in word, in conversation, in charity, which is love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. See? Just because you're young doesn't mean that you can't be a powerful example for Christ. And if you are a Christian and your testimony is it's caught up in video games. I use video games a lot, friends, because I see so much of it today. You have to understand, 20 years ago, it, was very, it wasn't that much then. You know, About 25 years ago, hardly no such thing. I mean, when I was a kid, probably in my teenage years, they had just come out with, I don't know, Android or something, some kind of little TV game. You hooked to the TV and all you're doing is trying to sync some kind of stupid looking figure that floated across your screen. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of kids that got into that. I really, I mean, it was so fun for a little bit, but I didn't care. I wanted to be outside playing is what I wanted to do. But, uh, but nowadays, children don't, they, they know no other conversation except that through a, a computer. And that's terrible. That's terrible. It's absolutely, it's mind-boggling to me, you know. So if you are a believer and you're confessing to be, remember, it says, let not man despise thy youth. That's a message to us as adults. You know, if you've got a child, a teenager that loves the Lord, don't look down upon them because they're young. And for you as a young person, excuse me, this is actually the more the message for the older person, be thou an example. Two of the believers in word and in conversation. So if you're the parents of these young people, be an example to the young people in everything you do. You can't expect your children to carry a good godly life unless you do. Okay, let me look at Romans chapter 8. And we'll, we'll close with this one right here, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. I have many, many more written out here. And um, uh, you know what? Let me go back to Timothy, though, chapter 5. I started that one there, so there must have been a reason I wanted you to know that. So let's go back to Timothy again. Chapter 5, and it's verse 1 and 2. Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him uh, uh, as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters, with all purity. The reason why I remember now why I marked that, you know, when it says here, the younger as sisters, talking about the younger women, that's so important, especially for young men, that are at the age of dating and things like that, you're to treat that girl that you might be dating as a sister. And that's why it started that there. It was really important, I felt, to make that mention to you. Treat her as a sister. Never mistreat her. Never violate her in any way whatsoever. She's a daughter of God. And young sisters, if you're at that age that you're wanting to, to, you're getting serious about wanting to date someone, make sure it's a godly young man. And make sure it's a man that will not violate you in any way. And don't give, don't give a place for him to do such a thing. You know, but anyway, just wanted to say that just to encourage you guys. Um, and, and let's go real quick to Romans 8. Uh, verse 28. 
And we all we know that all things work together for God for good to them that love God, to them who are are the called according to his purpose. Now the reason why I wanted you to know that is because sometimes in life, I'll just say this to you in closing. When we are going through things in life, we realize that um, well, we do things wrong. We get mixed up into certain things. But as Paul said here, all things work good together for them that love the Lord. In other words, though fiery trials come upon you, though all kinds of strange things happen in your life, He knows about it. And there's nothing strange that happens. That in it, there will be a blessing and I know that I'm not necessarily speaking in some of the evils that can happen to young girls, things like that. That's certainly not a blessing at all. It's an evil. And I would really encourage, it's something I just feel to say to you, especially parents and even young people. There's a lot of evil that happened to girls when they're young. And as parents, watch your children watch your girls. Sometimes it comes from the strangest place, the place you wouldn't think it to be. And young men, you always remember, you respect every girl there is. Younger ones are even teenagers because Satan will put all kinds of garbage in people's minds. And believe me, when you see the, the, let me just tell you another thing too. When you see these little things on TV and they show uh, something happening to a girl being, being molested or something like that, turn that garbage off. That'll, Satan will plant that seed in your head and the next thing you know you're trying to enter, you're, you're dealing with a thought that you can't seem to get rid of. It's one reason why I hate television. You know, I'm not against people having it, but I'm sure against those things that, they, that Satan slips in there and they call that entertainment or something like that. That's not entertainment when they're showing women being violated or abused in any way whatsoever, young, old. Even when they do sometimes the news and they're speaking about it or they have this one show that, that's on there talking about court trials and they're talking about children that are molested, but yet they're putting this before you every single day. That's wrong. You respect young girls and love them. As the Bible said, treat them as a sister with kindness and with love. And if you've gone through anything in life, I pray God's mercy upon you and ask Him that He'll bless you and keep you. And I can't stress enough though that Jesus Christ loves you. He loves you with all of his heart and he's wanting you to give your life to him. And this room is hot as all get out. He wants you to give your life to him. And this is the hour for you. He's knocking at your heart. And if you don't feel like he's knocking at your heart, then maybe pray, ask him to. Say, Lord, if you're really there, show me that you're there, believe me. Show me that you're there, Lord. Bang on his door. You know, some people say, well, you know, I don't even know if God really exists. Well, why don't you ask him? Ask him that question straight up. Don't be afraid to ask him. Just say, God, if you really exist, you know, go sincerely from your heart. If you really exist, Lord, would you, would you make, make yourself known to me so I'll know you exist? Because sometimes that's why young people don't even acknowledge the Lord. They don't believe that He does exist. Well, it's a little bit late to say that He doesn't because the things that Jesus said that, that we would do because He would be with us even in us happen on a daily basis somewhere in somebody's life. You know, He said that if you lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. I've seen the sick healed. I've seen the dead raised. I've seen the blinded eyes open. I've seen cripples walk. But of course, there's some people that say, you know, I've seen somebody pray for Grandma or, or, or my Aunt Susie and she had cancer and she died. He didn't say that every single one would recover. 
And who do you, how do you know that maybe that he wanted Aunt Susie or whoever it was to come home to be with him? Maybe they were tired and the battle had been fought and it was time to come home. I've gone through that struggle in life as well. After seeing all the miracles I saw and then pray for someone that was dying and then they died anyway. And Satan fought me on that one. But nonetheless, Jesus Christ is so real and He wants you, He wants your life to be fully wrapped up in His. So I encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. I guess I got lights too close to me this morning because they put out some heat, boy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come before you, Lord. And maybe there's someone that'll be listening, whether it's on live stream or whether, Lord, it's, it's out on YouTube that'll be listening to this message today to young people. And maybe it's even older people that want to rededicate their lives to the Lord. That Maybe there's things that we've spoke about because I know that even older people get really caught up into video games and, and different movies that are not right. And I pray, dear God, for them. I ask you, Lord, that, that you would first and foremost, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive the, any, any young person that might be coming before you. I pray, Lord, that they will confess their own sins to you from their own lips to you, dear God, that they would ask you for forgiveness, Lord, and that they would ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart. If it was me and I were them right now, if I were them, I would be saying, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sins and my iniquities, dear God, that I've done in life. And that, God, I want you to live in my heart, Lord. I want you to come and be in me, Lord Jesus, and take control of my life, Yeshua. Take complete control. As you died on the cross, dear God, your side was opened up so that the Spirit of Almighty God could come out and could come back upon me as a believer, Lord. Let your life live in me. You said that, that in that day you will know that I am in you and I am in my Father and that, that we're one. And I'm just paraphrasing, but Lord, you said that would be God grant that so to these young people or even the older people that are wanting your life to be lived inside of them, dear God. I pray for them, Lord, and I ask you, Lord Jesus, forgive us of our sins, Lord. Make us one with you, dear God. Fill them with the Holy Ghost, Lord. Cause them to have a desire to want to be baptized because as you lay your life down, you become a sacrifice to God, and the sacrifice must be washed. And so I pray, dear God, that they'll have a desire to be baptized in your name, the Lord Jesus Christ, dear God. I ask it for them, Lord, and pray for them. And I ask you, Lord, to put a burning desire in these people's hearts that give their life to you. And may you just put a hedge up around them so that Satan can't touch them, that they might strengthen and build in you, dear God. I ask it, Lord, in the precious name above all names, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you. God bless you for being here with us if you were able to be here live. And uh, I really pray. You know, one thing I mentioned in, uh, just in prayer, so let me just expound on it really quickly. If you've given your life to Christ today, water baptism is so important. I know that we do see like the thief on the cross, he was not baptized. And the reason he was not baptized was because he didn't get the chance. He just recognized Christ in his last hour. Uh, of life and yet he still made it in and there will still probably be people that will happen to in life but if you have the opportunity and you know to do that remember when you give your life to him you have become a sacrifice to God on his altar and when you become a sacrifice to God on his altar then you're, you should be washed you know you should be washed from your sins let, in other words, in water baptism, the sacrifice was to be washed and then it was presented to the Lord. So it would be a clean sacrifice. So go to the water baptism and be washed, showing that your sins are washed away. And let Him come in and feel your heart. That's what being born again is all about. 
It's receiving the life of Jesus Christ inside of you. So I encourage you to do these things today and don't put it off. Find someone to baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I know some people will say, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I actually quote that scripture as well. Uh, I have also, I know that in the original Greek language, that's not even in there. But still, if you do what Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Jesus says, I come in my Father's name and you receive me not. And his name is Jesus, a Yeshua, which is God's name. It means uh, Hashem is your Savior. And he says, I won't leave you comfortless. I'll come to you and be with you, even in you. So he claims to be the very Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's going to live in you. So that's why I believe in baptizing in the name of Yeshua. And we see that Paul did that. We see Peter did that. So it's because why? They knew what the name was. It's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. These are just the titles for God. But you're a father and you might be a son. But that's not your name. Anyway, just something to thought. I don't fuss about that, just something to think about. Um, so a lot of times when I do baptize, I actually quote that scripture as well, uh, Matthew 28, uh, about Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then, but I also quote the scriptures from Acts and from uh, Acts chapter, I think it's two, and chapter uh, 19 as well on water baptism. Anyway, God bless you. We love you. Shabbat Shalom.